A ring of carbon fiber blades wider than a city bus whispers, and a Boeing 777 rises like it's nothing. This is the GE 90-115B, fire under control, metal under stress, and power under watch. Early 1990s, Boeing wants a long-range widebody that crosses oceans with just two engines. Regulators require a twin-engine aircraft to be able to fly safely if one engine fails, meaning each engine must be able to lift the jet alone during climb. General Electric answers with the GE-90 family. The 115B variant delivers 115,300 pounds of thrust. Two monsters, less drag and maintenance than four engines, but only if each one is brutally reliable and blisteringly strong. So, naturally, the question follows. How does something this big actually do its job? At heart, the GE90 is a high-bypass turbofan, really two machines sharing one shaft. Up front, a giant fan moves a broad stream of cool air around the core. That slow, cool air provides most of the push, quietly and efficiently. Deep inside, the hot core handles the chemistry. Air is sucked in, squeezed tight, mixed with fuel, lit, and blown out the back. Engineers joke, suck, squeeze, bang, blow. On this scale, the bang is a disciplined blaze, trimmed by computers so it behaves like a metronome, not a firecracker. And we have got a quick question for you. How much air, by mass, does the GE90 swallow every second at takeoff? Drop your guesses in the comments. All right, with that hanging in the air, let's start where it all begins. The fan. 22 scimitar-shaped blades made of carbon fiber, not metal. Composites let GE sculpt blades that stay stiff at the hub, but flex at the tips, shedding shockwaves and cutting noise. Each weighs about 20 kilograms, a heavy suitcase, so one tech can lift it, yet it shrugs off hail and frozen birds in certification tests. The fan spans 128 inches, 3.25 meters. Tip speeds flirt with Mach 1 and a thick, lined fan case stands ready to contain anything that breaks loose. Now that the cycle's clear, let's meet the giant at the front that makes the first move. Behind the fan, rows of spinning and stationary blades act like a massive air pump. The low-pressure compressor gives the first shove. The high-pressure compressor keeps stacking pressure until the air is roughly 40 times denser than ambient. Variable stator vanes, think adjustable blinds, keep flow smooth when pilots change power. High pressure is leverage. The more you pack in before burning, the more work the turbine can harvest, and the less fuel you need. All that pressure begs for flame. Into the combustor we go. In the annular combustor, kerosene is misted into that hot, compressed air, and spun so the flame locks in place. Temperatures soar high enough to melt ordinary metal, but careful shaping and cooling protect the walls. Too hot and emissions spike. Too cool and efficiency dies. A web of sensors watches temperatures and pressures, and the digital brain trims fuel in pin-sized steps, so the fire stays clean and strong. Fire made the energy, now the turbines have to steal it back. Exhaust races rearward and slams into turbine blades, tiny wings turned backward, stealing just enough energy to spin the compressors and that massive fan. Here, materials science borders on magic. Blades are grown as single crystals so they don't creep and stretch. Ceramic-like coatings reflect heat. Microscopic holes bleed a thin film of cooler air over each blade. Every extra degree the metal can survive becomes another notch of efficiency. Now something has to keep it all in sync. That's FADEC. Pilot set thrust. FADEC, full authority digital engine control, runs the show. Two independent computers watch shaft speeds, pressures, temperatures, vibration, fuel flow, cross-checking constantly. If one channel hiccups, the other keeps going. FADEC angles veins, opens bleed valves, meters fuel with surgical finesse, and guards every limit so the engine never cooks itself or stalls. Quiet conductor, very loud orchestra. Brain engaged, now it's showtime. From dead still to full roar. On the ramp, the core needs a spin to wake up. Compressed air from the APU or a ground cart does the trick. At a set speed, FADEC feeds fuel and sparks the igniters. A cough of flame stabilizes, the core accelerates. The low-pressure turbine starts hauling the fan. Idle holds. Down the runway, both GE90s surge near their limits. From the cabin, you feel a smooth shove and hear a deep, velvety rumble. One engine alone could keep the jet climbing, an unsettling thought the design handles with margin to spare. 
Once airborne, brute force gives way to quiet efficiency and constant care. At 35,000 feet, the 777 needs only a slice of that brutal takeoff thrust. The big fan's slow airflow shines, giving lots of push for little burn. The engines hum, temperatures settle, and fuel flow drops to a sensible trickle. That calm cruise is backed by trust. Regulators let the 777 wander up to 330 minutes from a diversion airport because stats say these engines almost never surprise anyone, built on millions of flight hours and constant data. Keeping it that way takes constant checkups. A modern engine is a flying clinic, vibration traces, exhaust temps, oil debris counts, pressure ratios, everything streams to maintenance teams. Software flags tiny shifts that hint at bearing wear or blade erosion. Need eyes on it? A borescope snakes through ports to inspect blades without tearing the engine apart. Modular design means whole sections swap fast. Overhauls happen by cycles and hours, not smoke and panic. That confidence didn't come free. Before a single passenger flight, GE tried to break the GE-90 on purpose. Frozen birds fired into the fan, sheets of water and ice gulped at full power, blades snapped to prove the case could trap shrapnel. They ran it scorching hot for hours, then froze it, then cooked it again. Only after surviving that abuse did it earn its spot under a 777 wing. Flight has no room for guesswork, and this engine proved it. So, numbers land better with anchors. 115,300 pounds of thrust could yank a freight train if the hitch didn't vaporize. That 128-inch fan is wider than many regional jet fuselages, and in one second it moves more air than you'll breathe in hours. Turbine temp climbed past 2,192 degrees Celsius, yet those single crystal blades shrug it off for thousands of cycles. And most of the time, the GE90 loafs at cruise, barely flexing. When it's time to come home, thrust rolls back. Touchdown triggers a translating sleeve. Blocker doors pivot. Cascade vanes bend bypass air forward to help the brakes. Off the runway, fuel cuts, flame dies, and the fan freewheels to a stop, a giant windmill winding down. Ground power plugs in. The beast cools, waits. And the future? GE9X takes the template and trims it. Thinner composite blades, higher pressure ratios, smarter cooling for even thriftier burn and lower emissions. But the GE90 proved the core idea. Build huge, control it digitally, trust it over oceans. Now that we've felt the muscle, watched the shutdown, and peeked at the sequel, let's rewind to how this monster was born in the first place. Boeing wanted a two-engine widebody that could match four-engine jumbos on range and payload. Pratt and & Whitney and Rolls-Royce powered the first 777s, but GE won the high-thrust, long-range stretch, freighter, with a bold bet on composite fan blades and an ultra-high bypass ratio. The GE90 family entered service in 1995. The 115B hit a 127,900-pound test record in 2002, earned certification in 2003, and flew passengers in 2004. ETOPS rules demanded rock-solid reliability, and the 115B proved a giant could have manners letting airlines fly farther for less. So, the secret's out. And remember the question earlier? How much air by mass does the GE90 swallow every second at takeoff? At takeoff, the GE90 115B swallows roughly 2.5 tons of air every second. That's more air in one heartbeat than you'll breathe in hours. So, which engine should we dive into next? The SR-71 Blackbird's Blazing J-58 or the Concorde's Supersonic Olympus 593? Drop your pick in the comments and hit subscribe so you don't miss the next deep dive into aerospace engineering. Picture an engine so fierce it could hurl a 20-ton jet toward the edge of space, yet fragile enough to melt if pushed too far. This is the Tumansky R-15, the raw power behind the MiG-25 Foxbat the Soviet Union's fastest fighter. The MiG-25 was not designed like any normal fighter. It was born during the height of the Cold War when American spy planes like the SR-71 Blackbird could fly higher and faster than any interceptor. The Soviet Union needed something that could catch it. That meant creating a jet that could hit speeds well beyond Mach 2.8 and climb so high it would almost touch the edge of the stratosphere. A conventional jet engine could not handle that kind of punishment. 
At Mach 3, the air hitting the engine face is already blistering hot, hot enough to weaken most metals before the turbine even lights. The afterburner would be dealing with exhaust close to the temperature of molten lava. So, Soviet engineers did not try to make something refined. They went for sheer brute force. They wanted an engine that could survive a few minutes of unbelievable heat and stress, even if it meant replacing it often. The result was the Tumansky R-15. It was big, heavy, thirsty, and loud. But it could push a 20-ton interceptor past Mach 3 in level flight if the pilot was willing to risk it. But a design on paper is only the beginning. To build a jet that could break the rules of speed, they had to choose the right materials. Unlike the SR-71 Blackbird, which was made mostly from titanium, the MiG-25 was almost entirely stainless steel. It was not because steel was better, but because the Soviet Union simply did not have enough titanium production capacity at the time. The R-15 engine followed the same approach. Its compressor and turbine stages were built from heat-resistant stainless steel and basic nickel alloys, with only small amounts of titanium in the cooler parts. This made the engine heavier than it could have been, but it was much cheaper and easier to build in large numbers. Even the MiG's massive air intakes were built from steel plates with sharp, knife-like edges. Inside were moving ramps that slowed down the supersonic airflow before it hit the engine face. That meant the R-15 did not have to handle completely chaotic shockwaves at Mach 3, but the air entering it was still hundreds of degrees hot even before combustion. To cope, the turbine blades were made from a simple nickel-chrome alloy and coated with a basic thermal barrier. They were designed to take the punishment just long enough. No exotic single crystal ceramics, no complex cooling channels. It was designed to be rugged and easy to replace rather than indestructible. Here's a quick question for you. At full throttle, how much fuel do you think the MiG-25 burned in just one hour? Take your best guess and leave it in the comments. We will reveal the answer just before the outro. Now with the materials ready, it was time to shape them into a machine that could survive Mach 3. At the heart of the R-15 sat an 11-stage axial compressor. Each stage had a ring of large steel blades that squeezed the incoming air tighter and tighter until it reached 11 times atmospheric pressure. The blades were forged from solid billets of steel and nickel alloy, then machined and polished. They were not sculpted to the microscopic perfection of Western jet engines, but they were good enough to do the job. Behind the compressor sat the turbine section with two main stages. The turbine blades were cast in simple molds, heat treated to survive up to 1,832 degrees Fahrenheit and mounted on a long central shaft that ran the full length of the engine. Here was the catch. At Mach 3, the turbine inlet temperature could spike well beyond that limit. Western engines would have used advanced cooling systems to protect the blades. The Soviets simply accepted that the blades would warp and stretch if pushed too far. If the pilot stayed above Mach 3 for too long, the engine would literally cook itself. It was a disposable design, made for bursts of extreme performance rather than endless life. Behind the turbine was the real torch. The afterburner was a giant pipe where raw fuel was dumped into the exhaust and ignited for a massive boost of thrust. The R-15's afterburner was primitive but devastatingly effective. It had a series of fuel manifolds and flame holders simple metal rings that kept the fire stable even at supersonic speeds. When lit, it turned the exhaust into a white-hot plume stretching almost 10 meters behind the jet. At full afterburner, each R-15 produced over 22,000 pounds of thrust. Two engines together gave the MiG-25 more than 45,000 pounds of raw thrust. That was enough to launch the Fox Bat from a runway straight into the thin air above 65,000 feet in minutes. But it came at a cost. The afterburner burned fuel so fast that the MiG could empty its tanks in less than 45 minutes of flight. And because the nozzle was just steel with no fancy cooling, it glowed bright orange after a few minutes at top speed. And once you had the firepower, the next challenge was putting it all together. The R-15 was built for mass production. Each major part, the compressor drums, the turbine modules, the afterburner rings, was made separately in Soviet factories and shipped to the Tumansky plant for final assembly. Technicians stacked the compressor stages one at a time on the long shaft, checked the alignment with optical tools, then bolted the two turbine stages at the rear. Finally, they attached the enormous afterburner can with hundreds of bolts and rivets. There were no digital simulations, no laser measurement tools, 
It was mostly manual assembly using jigs and fixtures, but it worked because the tolerances were intentionally simple. The engine was not supposed to be a perfect Swiss watch. It was supposed to be a hammer. Once assembled, each engine was mounted in a concrete test cell. Technicians ran it at idle, then mid-power, and finally slammed it into full afterburner. If it survived the test, it was declared fit for a MiG-25. On the test stand and in the air, the R-15 proved it was pure muscle. With both engines in full afterburner, the MiG-25 could climb to 65,000 feet in under 5 minutes. It could cruise at Mach 2.8 for long enough to intercept a target and then turn for home. Pilots could push it to Mach 3.2 in a straight line, but they knew it would probably destroy the engines. Turbine blades would stretch, crack, or even break off if you stayed that fast too long. The flight manual specifically warned pilots not to exceed Mach 2.83 unless it was an emergency. Of course, test pilots sometimes ignored that just to see what the Fox Bat could really do. The result was world records. In 1977, a specially modified MiG-25 climbed to 123,000 feet in a near-ballistic arc. Another set a world speed record at Mach 3.2. The R-15 was a time bomb, but it delivered. But why did this engine exist at all? To understand that, you have to go back to the height of the Cold War. The United States had the U-2 spy plane, flying higher than any Soviet interceptor. Then came the SR-71 Blackbird, cruising at Mach 3 and outrunning every missile. The Soviet Union needed a jet that could match it. The Mikoyan Design Bureau was ordered to build an aircraft that could reach Mach 3, climb beyond 65,000 feet, and destroy any intruder. Sergei Tumansky's team didn't have the time or resources for a revolutionary design. They scaled up an existing turbojet, making it simple to build and powerful enough for short bursts of extreme speed. The MiG-25 first flew in 1964 and shocked Western intelligence. When a pilot defected to Japan in 1976, engineers saw a crude but brilliant machine. It was not elegant, but it did exactly what it was meant to do. Remember the question earlier? At full throttle, how much fuel do you think the MiG-25 burned in just one hour? So, the answer for that is, at full throttle, Pilots reported the MiG-25 burned fuel faster than a Boeing 747 at takeoff, roughly an estimated 18,000 liters in just one hour. That was enough to drain its tanks in under 45 minutes. It was inefficient and rough, but it worked. The Tumansky R-15 was never meant to be elegant. It was built for one purpose, to give the Soviet Union an interceptor that could outrun anything in the sky. And it succeeded, forcing the West to rethink high-speed aircraft. Which would you rather see next? The SR-71 Blackbird's J-58 engine or the Concorde's Olympus 593? Tell us in the comments and don't forget to subscribe.